Does it have anything to do with one in five females as cause <laughs> <laughs> Yes. All right. Thanks for coming out. Um, this is going to be. It's, I call it a live mixing workshop, but really it's a crash course to doing live sound. So we will get into like actual sound mixing at the end, but a lot of it's just going to be like absolute basics of things you need to know in order to be the sound guy for the show. So um, we're going to go over some basic EE stuff, super basic EE stuff, because um, anything I do sound related, because I'm an electrical engineer, I kind of put it through an EE -E filter in my brain. You know, like, um, like talking about EQ or gain or something, I'm like, what is the electricity actually doing to make things sound that way? Um, cables, oh, we're just going to go over the different types of cables, and because that is extremely important. Um, speakers, microphones, and then um, I'll do a mix demonstration on how to do some mixing. So, to start off, um, this is Ohm's Law. If you have never seen it before, the top one is Ohm's Law, which is voltage is current times resistance. Um, and that comes into play a lot. And then the second one is power is current times voltage. And you, you'll see that a lot when you know, you're talking about how powerful is an amplifier, or how much power can a speaker hold? It'll be in watts, which and most and there's a couple different ways to talk about power, like peak or RMS and stuff. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, and also, it's very helpful in figuring out if you're renting a generator. You know, how much power is your system going to need, and how much do you need to supply it, and stuff like that. Uh, this is a good graphic to explain how. Um, Ohm's law works, right? Amps is like how much is how much stuff is trying to get through your, the wire. Voltage is how strong of a force is pushing the stuff through the wire, and then resistance is how hard is it to get through the wire. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. This is like one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go over some cables. Um, these are the six most commonly seen types in live sound. There's other ones like aux cords or um, uh, what you call it, uh, BCA. BCA is hey, um, and stuff like that. Anyway, but these are the main ones for you're going to need for live sound. So. This is an XLR cable. It stands for external line return. I don't know why it stands for that, but um, it's mostly used for microphones or like high quality, like higher quality like DJ sets or things like that. Um, that's what comes out of DIs. Um, it's a balanced signal. Um, I'll talk about what balanced means, but you can tell it's balanced because it has three wires, right? There's three things here and there's three things here. Um, hey, how's it going? Um, just so you know, this is, this is an XLR cable, okay? It's got three wires, and that's how you know that it's balanced. It's a balanced wire as opposed to an unbalanced wire, and I'll get into that later. Alright, this is a, called a quarter inch TS. Uh, the TS stands for tip sleeve, and that means there's a black insulator wire here, and then you have the tip conductor, and the sleeving conductor, okay? And it's unbalanced, so it has two connectors. Um, these types of connections can be used both for um, uh, instruments or speakers. It was originally designed for um, phones, you know, like the original switchboards um, that operators used all use these. They are also called phone plugs. Not to be confused with phono plugs, which is another word for RCA. All right, this is a quarter inch TRS meaning tip ring sleeve. You can see there's two, um, uh, there's two insulators. So you have the tip, the ring, and the sleeve. And so these, and that, that is congruent with the three wires that are going to be running through the cable. And that is balanced. Or it can be used as stereo. For example, a lot of times the tip will be left channel, the sleeve will be the right channel. No, the ring will be the right channel, and the sleeve will be ground. 
Um, and then uh, if you, oh, going back to this, the reason there's two here is going back to this, right? If this is like your guitar or something, you need one wire that goes in and you need one wire that goes out because that's how the circuit works. Um, oh yeah, so sometimes um, you'll have, get things like this where you have an XLR on one side and a TRS on the other side and you can do that because they both have three connections. Uh, this is called RCA. It's called RCA, uh, I guess Radio Corporation of America was some sort of corporation probably that standardized this. Um, it's also called a photo connector because um, it was most often used with phonographs and home s sound systems um, before a track or cassette or CD was invented. So that's why they're called phonograph, phono. Um, it's a TS configuration, right? Um, because it's got this part and then the ring, the sleeve on the outside. So it's, yeah. Do, are guitar cables usually TR or TRS? TS. TS. Two connections. Yeah. Okay. Guitar cables are always TS. Okay. Yes. Um, and that's why you need a DI box if you're plugging a guitar directly into a mixer, which I'll go over later. Um, um, these cannot, the reason there's two here is they're often used as a serial pair, right, left and right. And so you might think, oh, there's four connections. You got one, two, three, and four. But you can use it in stereo like this because this sleeve and this sleeve and this sleeve are all the same connection, really. They're all ground. Uh, this is a speak on uh, connector, also called Neutrik. Neutrik is the company that I think invented them, and they're the most popular company that still makes them, but you know, lots of other companies do. So, technical name is Speak On. Um, these are solely used for speakers, um, and so they're designed to hold a lot more power and uh, current um, because. People were using regular TS jacks for speakers for a very long time, but really they don't have a lot of, um, when the jack goes in, it, there's not a lot, a lot of actual metal connection, so you get some power loss through there, and they're not super sturdy, so if you have like a giant subwoofer that's really vibrating, they can also, sometimes will just pop right out. And so these things are great because they stick in, and then you turn them, and they click, and they'll stay in. Um, they can either be two or four wires, um, and you'll see this is like the back, this is like a, a speak on connection taken apart. This is where all the connections happen, and you can see there's four connectors. Um, for most, most of the time you're only using two of them, but you can configure them pretty much however you want, and so a lot of times you can use a four wire method where you're um, like going from um, some amplifiers are set up so all just plugging into one will give you two full channels out and then you can split it at the end and go into two speakers and you only have to deal with one wire at your amplifier end. Um, this is what the female end looks like. That's what you plug it into. Uh, this is a banana plug. It's not really used in audio much at all anymore just because um, the speak on is so much better in terms of uh, reliability and um, power loss and stuff, but um, they are used all the time in the EE building whenever we're working with equipment. A lot of times, um, like pretty much all of the lab equipment in the EE building um, uses the banana plugs, but it'll be like just a single wire like this, um, and that, that's what you connect to. And the cool thing about these is they're both female and male. As you can see, you can just stick one right into the other one which can come in handy sometimes. Um, yeah, the connecting wires can be easily removed. Um, you just, you literally just stick the wire in here and then at the inside here, there's a little screw where you can just screw it in. So that's nice because you don't have to solder anything and it makes for easy switches and stuff. Um, yeah, so that's it for cables. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Do you know why microphones and guitars use different cables? Yes, I do. Oh. Okay, so balanced versus unbalanced. The way, the reason there's three <clears throat> pins on
on a XLR cable or a TRS cable is one, one wire will be the positive signal, one wire will be the negative signal, and one wire will be ground. And so literally, like, when you send out, um, when it's coming out of like a mixer, the mixer will take your regular signal, and then it'll duplicate it and invert it. So you have 180 degree phase shift, or essentially the opposite signal, and it puts that on the negative wire, right? So you can see this one goes up and then down, and this one goes down and then up. And the reason that this they use this is because when you're traveling a long distance through a wire, you'll get noise, electrical, electromagnetic noise and interference will go into the wire and you can get some loss and stuff. And so I, I kind of tried to describe that here. You have opposite signals going through the wire, but when noise gets introduced, it'll be the exact same kind of noise because the wires are literally right next to each other. So as you can see, this goes up and this one little goes up, right? And this one goes down, up, down, and this one also goes down, up, down. And so when you get inside whatever's receiving it, like a mixer or a DI box or whatever, it will flip this signal back around and then add them together. And what that does is now you have the exact same original sound wave that gets saved, but because the noise is the exact same, when you flip it around, it's actually opposite now, and it gets canceled out and you don't have it anymore. Um, the reason you use that with microphones all the time is because microphones, especially passive dynamic microphones, will have extremely low voltage output, so any noise that comes in will be like decently loud in comparison to your traveling signal. Um, that's called signal to noise ratio. The reason that guitar cables don't use TRS like this is um, um, Guitar pickup outputs are, have a lot more power output than a standard um, speaker, I mean microphone. And most of the time you're only going, you know, 10, 15 feet to your amplifier. And so you really don't need this TRS thing. Also, that's just kind of the norm, that's how it was designed in the first place, right? But sometimes, you know, if you're doing a live stage, you'll have a microphone on the stage, and then you have to get that microphone signal, you know, 300 feet over to wherever the mixing console is. And you need to be able to do that without getting a lot of current going and stuff. Um, okay, there's a very important difference between a speaker cable and an instrument cable, okay? The, is, the, um, the positive end and the, like the tip is what's carrying the signal, and then the secondary one is ground. And ground it doesn't really matter too much if there's noise on ground because whatever, it, um, that's not what's actually carrying the audio signal. And so a lot of times with, um, with instrument cables, with TS cables, they'll take the ground and they'll actually use a wire mesh that just envelops the, um, the, the positive rail and that pr protects it actually and keeps um, noise from getting in. It's not as effective as a balanced wire, but it does really help, right? The problem with this is it's designed for low um, low voltages and low currents, and so most of the time this wire will be actually very small in proportion to this, right? And so if you were to try to power um, a big speaker through it, you will um, you'll get a lot of current going through it and it'll heat up and the wire will either fail or melt if you get enough resistance going through it, which is turned into heat, and uh, that's not good. So what, what a speaker cable is, right, is this is not a metal um, insulation. This is just like, I don't know, some sort of glass or pla I mean, plastic or something, right? And then the two wires are the same size, and they're usually a lot thicker. All right. Now we're going to learn how to coil a cable. So everyone pick a cable. <laughs> this, is, this is the way to coil a cable, so when you undo it, it doesn't have a bajillion, like, kind of still wraps in it, right? And it's a lot easier to wind it back up without getting any bad kinks and stuff in it. So you hold it in your left hand like this. Go right here so you can see me in the camera. 
and then um, hold it like this, all right, and then just do a loop, okay, and then now turn your hand this way and go under it, just so you're holding it like this. There you go. Ever got it? And then you're gonna turn your hand this way. Yeah. Just turn your hand in. Yeah, but but you want to put it on the other side. You got this hard. <laughs> I know. I can Let me do this again. Normal. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you hold it like this, right? And then you turn your hand around. And then it forms a loop just like this. All right. And then you do a regular one where you hold it like this, and then you just do a regular loop, and then you do the other way where you go back and wrap it around. And what this does is you're essentially you're turning the cable one way, and then you're turning the cable the other way, right? And so that way, when you unravel it, all the the turns kind of cancel each other out. So you go one way, and then you go the other way. And then you go one way, and then you go the other way, like that, until I've got the whole thing done. But I did a bad job because all of these loops are different sizes. So if all the loops are different sizes, try again, just because this is the time to practice. Okay, so this is a mic stand. Just, I'm sure you guys have all seen one before. Um, just. The, to extend the life of all of the joints in a mic stand, you always want to loosen it before you move it, right? So instead of just, you want to loosen it and then move it and then retighten it, okay? It just makes all of the gears and everything last longer. And then the fastest way to take one of these off or on is not to just unscrew it like this. You actually you hold this and then you just twist the thingy, right? And so, you have, obviously, you have to loosen this so it moves, right? But then it's super easy to just screw it back on. It takes like a third of the time. So, that way. All right. So, going over speakers and amplifiers. Um, there's two kinds of speakers these days. Passive speakers and active speakers. An active speaker means the amplifier is built into the speaker. Both of these speakers are active, which means they need a power plug but the amplifier is built into them. Um, and then other speakers are passive, which means you don't need to plug in a power cable, you just have to run one line to it. And so this is another time where you know, it's really important to know the difference between a power speaker, passive speaker, and speaker cables and instrument cables, right? Because if it's a passive speaker, that means you need to send an instrument cable to it because it's a low power signal and then the built-in amplifier will amplify it, whereas if it's a passive speaker, you need a speaker cable to go to it because it's coming from an amplifier. Um, the, um, let's see, passive speakers are most helpful when you're doing permanent installations because like if you're doing it in like a church or a concert venue or something, most of the times the speakers will be mounted pretty high and then it's a lot easier to have the amplifiers or whatever at, at the same location as the mixer, because then you can turn them on, you can turn them off, they're right there, you can you know, deal with the volume and stuff, because most active speakers will have the volume control right on the speaker, and so if the speaker's really far or really high up, it's just a pain in the ass to deal with. Active speakers are super nice for um, mobile applications, like you know, live sound, if you're a DJ, or anything like that, because then you don't have to carry around a separate amplifier to various places. Um, Active speakers are becoming more and more. Um, another thing about um, another advantage of active speakers is because the amplifier is built in, the amplifier and the speaker are built at the same time and designed to work with each other. So you know that the amplifier isn't too powerful or not powerful enough for the speaker it's designed to be used for. And a lot of times they'll do some, you know. Um, EQing and stuff on the amplifier side to get you a better overall sound coming out. However, that also means you don't have as much customization abilities. So when you get into the higher end pro audio, you know, the, the, uh, 
the life sound gods that have been doing it for 45 years, you know, want to be able to control everything themselves. So that's when the passive is more helpful. Um, another, um, an advantage of using a passive system is if you have tons and tons of speakers, then you only have to run a speaker cable to each one, and you don't have to run a separate power to every single speaker, which can be annoying. Um, active speakers have become more popular, you know, recently. Um, it used to be like, you know, the most common thing you would see um, in uh, like a small venue would be a mixer head, which is a mixer like with microphone preamps and an amplifier built in in the mixer, and then you would plug in two passive speakers. Uh, these days it's becoming more popular to just have a passive mixer and then active speakers. Um, another thing you have to think about with passive is matching speaker impedance to um, your amplifier. So, um, going back to the Ohm's law, all speakers have a set amount of resistance. Uh, the standard values are 2, 4, 8, 16 ohms. And uh, the way uh, that resistance works is if you have two, um, two things with resistance, so for example two speakers, and you hook them up in parallel, which means like, what it, uh, um, if, you, if this is your power source, like an amplifier, you want to be careful to not go too low with your impedance because that will draw so much current from the amplifier that it will stop working, right? And so all, amp all amplifiers have a minimum rated load. Most of the time that's either four or two ohms. Um, and so you just have to be careful to not go under that. The, uh, the um, opposite end is if you if an amplifier is rated for 500 watts at four ohms, and you plug just a single 16 ohm speaker into it, you're actually gonna only get about 125 watts of power going through that speaker. Um, so impedance matching is important. All right, real quick overview. What time is it? Oh shit. Okay, going fast. Okay, dynamic mic can, uh, is passive. Uh, low output, um, you generally more rugged than the other two, most likely used, most commonly used, or works the best in live situations. Condenser mic um, is powered, which means it needs phantom power, so a lot of times on mixers you'll see like a fa phantom power button or switch. What that means is going through the ground, I think it's the ground, the ground wire of the 3 pin XLR is actually a 48 volt DC current. And so, um, the mixers, the, the mics can then use that current as a power source to power itself. Uh, ribbons are passive. Um, in general, they're a lot more fragile than uh, capacitors and dynamic mics because it's literally two magnets and then a really, really thin piece of aluminum. And then when you sing into it, you vibrate the piece of aluminum and that creates a charge across the two magnets. So if this little tiny piece of aluminum gets dropped or like it's broken, you're basically screwed, and, and so, yeah. Uh, here's, this is a Shure SM57, 58, the most popular and most widely used mic in all of existence. Um, that's an example of classic dynamic mic, and then condensers and ribbons. Um, a DI box, um, I have my backpack. A DI box is designed to take an unbalanced signal, like a guitar, from a guitar, and turn it into, on the other side of this box, will be, a, um, a three-pronged balanced signal out. And so you use this in stage applications if you're plugging in like a bass guitar or an unbalanced output from a keyboard or something like that because you're going to want to send that a really long way and you need a balanced signal in order to do that. It also does impedance matching. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but guitars have really high impedance, like you know anywhere from 4K to 20K, 20,000 ohms. Whereas the standard for like microphones is like 600 ohms. All right, I'm going to go into demonstration here. So could you point that guy over this way? Check, 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 check. check. Woo. Okay, so that's working. All right, so the the number the first thing to learn about is gain structure, and so all 
all electric components, or yeah, all electric components have like a top threshold of the maximum electricity and voltage that can go through it before it starts distorting and clipping. In guitar amps, that's a good thing because that changes the sound, right? Most of the time, though, when you get when you get to this point, you know the musicians have already got the sound that they want, so you don't want to mess with it. And so, um, it's important. Gain structure is all about getting the most volume you can without any distortion or clipping, right? Um, not all mixers have this, but any good mixer will have an input gain. And what that does is it takes the signal going in and it just turns it up, right? Because microphones have extremely low um, output voltages. And so the way I do this is this solo button, this is, this is like a volume indicator, right? Uh, what the solo button does is it turns it on so the volume indicator is only showing what's going through here. And I have it set up here as a level set, which means you're only seeing the voltage right at this knob. None, nothing else will affect it, right? So if I talk into it, let me turn that down a little bit. If I talk into it, you can see it's going up, right? You want to set it so it's right around zero dB. So that's a little too quiet. Check, woo, woo, there. So it's right around zero. That way, if the singer gets really overzealous and goes, ah! right? It's not gonna totally clip. Singers never do that. No, <laughs> never. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's gain structure, right? So that's, that's the first knob is just, nor the first thing you do when you sound check a band is you want to set all these knobs so they're all more or less around zero. That way you know how you have an even playing field to work with, right? Going down, these are auxiliary sends. And so if you, uh, uh, on the back of this amp, there's six outputs um, corresponding to one, two, three, four. And then if you hit this button, instead of three, four, it's actually five and six. Um, this, this, you know, one has six, some mixers will have like 24, some mixers will have one, some mixers won't have any. But what this is used for, uh, well, this can be used for a lot of things. For example, I use it for reverb or FX. Um, and, um, but also for monitors. And so I have that speaker hook s set up right now as a monitor speaker. So there's nothing, there's something coming out of there, but there's nothing coming out of there, right? Until I turn this guy up and then you'll see it coming out of there, right? And so you do that, so that way you can have a separate volume mix for the front. This is the thing, the speakers that the audience is listening to is called the front of house system. And then whatever the audience, the musicians are listening to is called the monitors, right? So it's good to have two volume controls like this because most of the time the singer, the you know, the band is going to be able to hear the drum set no matter what, right? And the guitar amps and most of the time the bass. But you can set it up however you want. So most of the time, you know, you're only going to want like acoustic instruments and vocals to come through the monitor speaker. So that's what that's for. Going down, we have EQ. Um, we've got treble, mids, and lows. What I really like about this mixer is it's got a frequency sweeper for the mids. So if I were to turn the mids up a lot, that's I can I can sweep through the the. The, the frequency spectrum, right? And so that is super helpful when it comes to um, figuring out or reducing and eliminating feedback, right? Most of the time, feedback happens at a certain frequency. So if you can figure out what that frequency is, you can set this there and then turn it down. Um, a good rule of thumb is any kind of vocal microphone and toms and kick drum you want to get rid of like a decent amount or even a lot of the frequencies somewhere between 100 and 200 hertz. That's where all the boominess comes from, all of that stuff, right? And, and it's it just, that's what makes somebody's voice unintelligible, is too much of that. So if you turn it down, it becomes a lot clearer and you can even turn the treble up if you want and it, then the singer will be a lot easier to be heard. Um, same thing, it's got, this also has a low frequency cut at 75 hertz, which is super helpful. Most of the time I'll have that on for every single input except for a kick drum or a bass guitar. This is the volume that gets sent to the master volume. This is the master volume over there, just for the front of house though. Um, these buttons set, can send it to these mixes, which are separate mixes. I'm not going to get into that. 
This is a pan, so you can go right or left. So right now on 15 and 16, that's where I have the music, right? Mm -hmm. And so I have it set up so this channel is all going to the left, and this channel is all going to the right. Because all of these channels are just a single channel. It's just a mono channel, right? Um, what time is it? Okay, we've got like five minutes. Okay, um, the way I like to set up reverb and effects is I have the um, auxiliary send three is going to my reverb unit, which is this blue one right here. Well, it's not my reverb unit, it's Daniel's. <laughs> and so you can see I have this turned up here. And so, woo! Um, and then my reverb is going into the box and then out of the reverb unit and then I have it plugged straight into this input 14 right here. And so when I talk, you can see this, um, the, what is that called? Volume indicator turns on, right? And so if I turn this on, woo, woo, there we got a little bit of stuff going, right? Um, reverb should be used in moderation, but it really helps to just fill out the mix and not make the singer feel like they're kind of just out in the open. You know, it helps cover up some small mistakes. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, what is feedback? You said. Oh. Okay. Move, everyone, move away from that speaker. <laughs> That's feedback. Right. And what happens is, it's the sound is going into the microphone, out of the speaker into the microphone and it's just creating a feedback loop that goes in bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and that's what feedback is. The, a sound engineer's number one job is to not make that happen. And so I just bought a unit. This thing is called the Behringer Feedback Destroyer Pro. I haven't really used it yet, but it uses some like really, really high Q um, EQs that can either automatically or manually, like you can set it, just take down specific frequencies and eliminate that kind of stuff. So I'm going to definitely be messing around with that at the UU show. Okay, um, some this unit here is a um, graphics unit. Woo. Um, it's, a, our, it's, a com it's a combination compressor, gate, and limiter. And so let me plug it in real quick. Um, Check. Let me turn that down. Woo! Okay, so I, this is a gate, and what that means is it turns off any noise below a certain volume threshold, right? And so you can see right here, there's a little light that says below or above. When I'm not talking, it's below, and this shows you how much of it's turning itself down, right? It's like all the way off. And then when I'm talking, it turns itself back on, and then it turns off again. This is the, the, the compression section. And what compression does is when you get above a certain volume, more or less, it turns it down. It doesn't turn it off, it just turns it down. So like above a certain volume level, if you were to go up another four decibels, it actually only turns you up like one decibel or something. And so that's what this ratio is, uh, this one, ratio. You can do a one to one, three to one, you know, four to one or whatever you want. And so right now I have it set at four to one. And you can see, you know, when it gets starts getting, when I start getting really loud, it'll start turning it down just a little bit, okay? In a live situation, you wanna use compression very, very sparingly. Because what you're, a lot, what also, compression is also doing is turning up the overall volume level of everything in that channel, right? It's turning down the, the super highs, but it's also kind of turning up everything a little bit. And so that's where feedback can happen, is all the, you know, the low reoccurring noises or like bleed from you know, other instruments or like a drum set, if the drum set is right behind the microphone, you know, it'll, um, it'll increase the chances of feedback. You, know, you don't have to worry about that at all in like studio recordings, but it's super important to be aware of that in live recordings. Finally, the last knob over here is a limiter, which just says anything above a certain volume level, it doesn't get any louder at all. It just squashes the signal, right? Um, I 
the only the, what I would use that for is just to kind of protect your um, amplifiers and stuff. If you have everything running all the way on, all the way full, full volume, um, that can help you get turn. You can turn your average volume up, and you don't have to worry about like any crazy spikes just killing your stuff. Um, any questions? No questions at all. <laughs> all right, cool. So uh, this is uh, oh, this is a graphic EQ, right? You can see all the different frequencies that you can like turn up and down, and so that can be helpful with working with feedback, or if you have a speaker system that's not perfectly, um, that doesn't have a perfect frequency response, right? If you have speakers that don't have a perfect frequency response, you can like turn up or down things to compensate, or if a room is really bassy at a certain frequency. You can mix with that. Do you use both that EQ and the EQ? I, I am not those? using this EQ because it's a shit EQ and has a bunch of background noise. <laughs> yeah, currently. Um, what else do I got? Oh, oh, a crossover. So this, the, right now these speakers are set up for full range, which means all of the sound is going through them, right? So, uh, when you get into bigger systems, like what we're going to have at the UU, you split the frequencies into high frequencies and low frequencies. The low frequencies go to a subwoofer, and everything else goes to the, the main system. And so what this crossover does is it takes the regular output from this mixer and splits it into the lows and highs. And then this is, the, this is a power amplifier. That's what I'm going to be using on Thursday for the sub subwoofer. And so, you know, the subwoofer just goes there, and then the regular stuff will go out to the speakers. All righty. Thanks for, thanks for coming out, guys. Uh, let me know if you have any more questions. And uh, let's pack this up really quick. <laughs>